Thank you so much for uh, letting me come here. This is a great opportunity for me. I'm not probably, I am the person in here with least knowledge about avalanche science. So this is a bit daunting for me to stand and talk here in, in front of you, but I'm super happy to be here. Um, and what I'm gonna talk about today uh, is the first uh, study that emanates from what is called the White Heat Project. And the aim of that project is to try to look into why and how people make decisions in avalanche terrain and try to really test and quantify um, the human factors or psychological aspects behind uh, decision making in avalanche terrain. Um, and I mean, it's, I can't say how important it is um, to of course have the right knowledge and have all the science on the, how the snowpack um, develops over time and, and to know what causes avalanches. But the fact is that we know that even though people have a whole lot of knowledge, we still make mistakes. And so we're really trying to look into that. But what I'm going to talk about today is, well, just be a, a glimpse of um, what we want to do, because this is, was a pilot study that we did uh, on Norwegian uh, skiers um, last spring. So we created an online survey where we asked Norwegian backcountry skiers to both tell us about their past experience of avalanche proper accidents and incidents, um, but also to make choices, hypothetical choices. This is not a perfect approach. From looking at accident statistics, we miss out on a lot of information because we don't know about all the cases where things did not go wrong, right? Um, we try to mitigate that by also looking at the cases where people had close calls. But that will still not tell us about all the, the unknown unknowns uh, when we did make a, a lot of wrong decisions but nothing bad happened. Um, we try to counteract that by also asking people to make hypothetical choices. But that is also um, has a limited validity because what we say that we will do and what we actually do are very different things. Um, so we're in the future, we're gonna try to go a bit further and actually look what people are doing um, by using the GPS tracks that you already are collecting. But I'm gonna talk about what we've found so far. Uh, and I'm gonna start talking about the, the avalanche experience. Among those, we found that 8% had had a proper accident where somebody got hurt, either they or someone in their party and 37% had had a close call. I was pretty um, surprised seeing this high number, that almost 40% of our sample had had a close call. So you have to wonder then, is this a super skewed sample? Who are these people? The thing is that w when we look at them, we ask them a, a ton of questions. Um, one of them was uh, about their willingness to take risk. Um, we did this in, in different ways, but what we see from this distribution is that, yes, we do have a few people who are very willing to take risk, but we also have, I mean, the great majority is in, in the lower section. So people don't seem to be these crazy risk lovers. Um, we do see that men are um, willing to take more risk than women. That might not be surprising, and the difference is statistically uh, significant. Um, we made uh, a big effort to reach a heterogeneous sample. Uh, we really didn't want to just reach the experts because, um, I mean, those are not representative for the entire population of, uh, that are out in the back country. And so we distributed the survey by a whole range of different methods. Um, we targeted women-specific groups, um, uh, Facebook groups that targets intermediate skiers, and so on. And we we managed to reach about 30% women. That might might sound low, but if you compare it to other studies, it's actually fairly high. The experience of the people that we reached, it's also fairly um, heterogeneous. Um, 
We actually managed to reach 28% um, with people who had no avalanche training whatsoever. And the majority has less than uh, level two or three avalanche education. Almost half of the group has more than five years uh, of backcountry skiing, but uh, quite a lot of them have fewer days. So the fact that we're seeing um, quite a lot of near misses isn't because we're just looking at people who are out in the backcountry um, many, many days. This is all just descriptive statistics. It doesn't tell us very much. So what we did next with the avalanche experience is that we, we ran some regression. So for those of you who are not familiar with statistical analysis, what that means is that we're checking the outcome variable, which is have you been involved in an avalanche incident? And we group them, so it's both avalanche accidents and near, near misses. And we control for, so we basically hold uh, experience, a uh, number of days in the avalanche terrain constant and check for how different things affect this probability of having been in an avalanche incident. So who are the people who have been involved in an avalanche incident in our sample? Well, not surprisingly, we find that people who state that they are willing to take a lot of risk are much more likely to have been in an avalanche incident. Um, the percentages here is the predicted probability uh, to having been involved. And this is, this is not just that 59% of those who state that they are willing have been in an avalanche incident. It is at an average level of experience, avalanche training, and the other stuff that I'm going to talk about. So this is a predicted probability. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, that, so you see that there are pretty big effects here, that those who say that they're willing to take risk, the probability that they have been in an avalanche incident is 59%, while those who state that they are unwilling is 14%. We also find that experienced riders are much more likely to have been in an avalanche incident. That's not very surprising either. Um, but you have to consider here that what this means, I mean, when we, when we are out a lot in the, um, in the backcountry, we of course learn. And if that learning curve was on par uh, with the increase in risk, the cumulative risk that we expose ourselves to, we should not see that experienced riders are overrepresented. The fact that we still find that people with a lot of experience are more likely to have had an avalanche incident, uh, it's not proof but it's in an indication that our skills do not rise on par with our, um, the, the cumulative risk. Um, we also find that people who state that they have formal avalanche training, so a level one or higher, have a much higher probability of having been in an avalanche incident. I put the, a dotted line here around it because we don't know if they got that avalanche training after the accident or before. And also we don't know who is, who are the people who are getting avalanche education. Do we get avalanche education because we want to get out into steep terrain? Um, in, in that case we also have a higher risk per se, so it's not that avalanche education creates it. And as an anecdote we have just recently um, started looking at the data from the US and there we can control for pre-avalanche education, and we see the, an opposite sign. So we, we see that people who had avalanche, formal avalanche training before the accident um, are less likely to be in an avalanche incident than people who did not. So I would take this one with a huge grain of scale. We also find that people who say that they tend to compare the lines that they ski with the terrain that other people ski are much more likely to have been in an avalanche incident. And we wanted to capture um, social comparison tendency and how we, um, so basically if people put up a lot of pictures on Instagram, how does that affect us? Um, this is still a very rough, it's a pilot. Um, so I'm, I'm not very sure about this result, but it's an indication that we should look further into this. And then the last one here is that we find that men are much more likely to have been in an avalanche incident than women. And this is not just that 
I mean, if we look at accidental data, we see that there are more men who are victims of avalanches than women. That doesn't tell us that men take more risk than women because there might be more men out there. So, but this one says that of a man and a woman who has equal amount of days and years in the backcountry, with similar risk preferences, and with similar education, the predicted probability that a guy has had an avalanche incident is 43%. For a woman, it's 16. So that was avalanche incidents. So let's look at the hypothetical choices. Hypothetical choices are very tricky. As I said, we don't know. I mean, we're sitting at home making a, a choice. It's very different from where, when we're standing at the summit of a mountain and the powder is fantastic and the, the feeling in the group is, is also great and we have to make a choice. Um, we wanted to make this as realistic as possible, so we described a hypothetical tour. We told people that, suppose that you're out with a group of people uh, that, you normally that you normally tour with and that you like to tour with. Um, it's a weekend and the end of March, you're in an area where you haven't been before. Um, you have toured up the mountain on a very low inclination ridge. The avalanche danger is two. Um, there's been a heavy snowfall previously this week, but today it's sunny. Um, imagine that you've reached the summit of, of this mountain and you have four different alternatives to ski <coughs> down. You can ski down the ridge. It is not avalanche terrain. Um, it has no exposure. Um, the snow is good, uh, but there may be some soft wind slaps. Or you can choose to ski down uh, what we call the field. It has no huge dangers. It's simple terrain. Um, there's a very short section above 30 degrees. Same thing, the snow is similar. Um, there are some, some soft wind slabs, um, but there are no big terrain features that are dangerous. Or you can choose to ski the bowl, which is challenging terrain. A large sec section of it is um, about 30, uh, and it's a terrain trap. Or finally, you can choose to ski the chute, which is, it, it is a terrain trap. It ends in a fjord. Um, this is actually very close for, from my uh, where I usually live. Um, also steep and a no pole zone. So which one of these would you, if you were to choose by yourself, which one would you prefer to ski given these conditions? And which one of these would you accept to ski if someone in your group said, I want to ski this, and nobody else says no? So if we look at how people chose, it's very clear that most people state that they prefer to ski what we would call the, the safe options, regardless if we ask them what they prefer and what, what they would accept to ski. Um, very few would accept and prefer to ski the chute. Um, it was probably uh, perceived as very technical. But what, what you can see here is that even though in both these, the dominant color is blue, when we ask people what they prefer and what they accept, a lot more people would accept to ski the, the bowl and the chute. And this difference is uh, significant. And we also ask people, how risky do you perceive that it would be for you personally to ski down this run, for all the runs? And people are willing to ski terrain that they perceive subjectively as substantially more risky than they state that they prefer to, to ski. I wouldn't say that this is super surprising. I definitely accept to do a lot of things that I don't prefer. I accept to carry out the garbage or clean up the house, even though I would prefer my party to do it. But in avalanche terrain, it's actually important. If I accept to do stuff um, that are riskier than, than I prefer. Um, we did the same thing um, for um, the relatively risky run. Um, and we ran a lot, uh, set of regressions of them. And the reason why we only have 333 here is that it was super important for us that we, because um, we wanted to evaluate how, how many people or what defines a person who is willing to, to ski down a relatively risky run. And then it's of course important that people perceive the riskiness of the run as we wanted them. 
I mean, it's, it's highly possible that someone would perceive, or we actually saw in the data, that some people perceive the, the riskiness of, of the field as more risky as the ball. And if we then define that as risky, we're doing something wrong. We can't interpret those results. So all these people perceive the, the ball and the shoot to be strictly riskier than the field, and the field is riskier and the, than the uh, rich. Um, but we, have, we still had relative relatively few people who wanted to ski the, the shoot. So what we've done here is that we combined the shoot and the ball, which most people perceived as very risky, and we treat those as risky choices, and then um, uh, the rich and, and the field as safe choices. And I should say this, that we, when we designed this, we chose the avalanche danger two. It was defined as a, a poor bonding between new and old snow. Um, a persistent weak layer further down that wasn't expected to be uh, active. We, we didn't want to identify crazy behavior. We wanted to just see like a heightened level of risk. But, so who mm -hmm. defines someone who wants to ski or who would ski a relatively risk to run? And we have to remember now that we asked about what do you prefer and what do you accept if someone else wanted to ski this? For both of these, we find that um, the choice to accept the ski, the ridge, or the bowl is correlated with uh, risk preferences. So people who are positive will, are more likely to accept and prefer to ski the shoot or the bowl. Um, but the most important part is people who perceive the risk to be low. So a person, it's not unexpected, people who perceive the, their personal risk to ski down one of these shoots are much more likely to actually choose to ski down these shoots. But we also find that people who state that they admire others who ski steep uh, are also much more likely to both prefer and to accept to ski down um, these steep shoots. So once again, it's, it's n nowhere near a proof. It's, it's more an indication that um, social norms and, and personal norms affect our choices. Concerning um, the choice to preference to ski steep, um, we find that self-assessed skills are very important. So people who are beginners um, are very unlikely to want to ski steep, whilst people who, who think that they are strong or expert skiers are more willing. And that is basically what we would expect. Uh, I mean, if, if I don't expect to, if I can handle to ride down something steep, the risk for myself to ski down it will be lower, and therefore I, I might be more willing to ski it. The strange thing is that we don't find any correlation with experience or skills when it, term, it, when it comes to accepting to ski down these steep chutes. So basically what we find is that people who rate themselves as beginners are equally likely to say that they would accept to ski down the steep runs as people who state that they are experts. And people with very little backcountry experience are equally likely to state that they would ski down these steep runs as people with a lot of experience. And I would say that that's very surprising. That it, it, it sort of predicts what we prefer to do, but not what we would accept to do. And a lot of choices that we make are based on what we accept to do. We find no e effect of avalanche training on preference. Um, that should not be interpreted as that avalanche training has no effect on what we do in the backcountry. Our intention when we designed this was, was to, um, to provide people with enough information so that even a person with very little knowledge would be able to assess the risk of going down. So we describe the avalanche danger in, in very simple terms. So what we find there is that uh, people who have formal avalanche training are much less likely to accept to ski down. My interpretation of that, this is still just correlations, but that seemed to suggest that avalanche training may make people do what they prefer. If I don't prefer to ski down, I, I won't accept to ski down it either. But it's very interesting that we find this difference between preferences and acceptance. Um, two things here um, are important. One is that um, perceived risk is such an 
enormous, uh, has such an enormous impact. So people who perceive the risk to be high only have 7% probability to prefer to ski down um, the, the steep runs, while the probability of someone who perceives it to be low is 37. Um, and we also found the fact that this thing is self-assessed skill. So we wanted to look into what determines those factors. What determines our, our perceived risk of a run and what determines our self-assessed skills. So we did that. So if we look at the person who perceives the risk to be low, it's correlated with people that has a lot of days and years in the backcountry and people who assess their skills to be high. Once again, not very um, surprising, but we also find that people, this, so we, people that presume that they were touring with skilled, more skilled people perceive the risk to be lower. And if I'm out skiing with a guide in real life, it's, it wouldn't be that weird that I feel a bit safer because I'm with someone who knows a lot of stuff. But we have to remember that these are hypothetical choices. And the perceived risk question was um, worded as how much risk do you think, um, how risky do you think it would be for you personally to ski down this run in terms of triggering um, and being caught by an avalanche or having an injury? In this hypothetical scenario, presume that you can get no more information than you have. And we find that people who assume that they were touring with someone more skilled perceive the risk to be lower. There's really no reason to, for why the risk should be lower in this case. I mean, a, a skilled partner will be able to save you, perhaps. It will be an effective partner. He, he or she knows how to use his, his transceiver and, and probe and shovel, but nothing else. So it's, it's re we were really surprised to find this effect. Um, it could be an indication that, and we, once again, we need to look into this more, but it could be an indication that if we are out and touring with people who are much more skilled than we are most of the time, because this was a group that, that you usually tour with, maybe we leave our decisions to them all the time and we don't really consider risk. That could be one um, explanation, but we're not sure yet. Um, the other thing that we looked at was um, what determines self-assessed skills. Um, we find that people who have high avalanche education assess their skills to be higher, people with a lot of experience, and riders to take, who are willing to take risk. That's expected. But we also find that if we compare to people who has no avalanche training whatsoever, and just look at the change in uh, a self-assessed skill, we find that people who has only a one-day course or an avalanche workshop, no formal education, they perceive their skills to be almost as high as people with avalanche level two or higher. While we don't find this effect at all for, for people with just avalanche level one. So there appears to be a, a jump from having no avalanche training whatsoever to having a one level course, um, which sort of indicates some, some sense of, of overconfidence. And we find that men rate their skills as much higher than women. And once again, what this is telling us is that a man and a woman with equal level of years and days in the backcountry, avalanche training, willingness to take risk, a man rates his skill to be higher. Now we, we don't know what type of train people ski. It's, it's highly possible that a man who spends uh, 40 days in the backcountry for, for 10 years um, skis steeper terrain and develops more. My partner is definitely a better skier than I am, even though we ski uh, equally many days. But it's, it's still interesting and perhaps not extremely surprising. So just to sum up, we find that most people say that they prefer to ski relatively safe terrain and that um, their choices correlate with uh, experience and also that uh, perceived risk correlates with experience and knowledge. But we also find that uh, some factors um, that appear to be more or less irre irrelevant affect choices. Uh, we find some gender effects. Um, we find that people tend to accept more risk that we say that we prefer. And um, we find that, um, that skills to, seems to increase more slowly than cumulative risk.
I've already talked a bit about the limitations of this study. Um, it's hypothetical, um, and we don't know what people actually do out in the backcountry, and accident data is problematic. So what we want to do next is that we want to not only look at hypothetical behavior, but also on actual behavior using GPS tracks provided by uh, Snow and Avalanche uh, Lab. And I just want to take this opportunity to send out a huge thank you to, because we launched uh, the American survey this year, and I know that a lot of you uh, representing the Avalanche Centers here have distributed that survey for us. And that has really helped us to gather a lot of data. So we, we truly appreciate that. And so we're hoping that we're, we're right now we have about, um, about seven or 800 usable responses. We hope that we'll get somewhat more. Um, and to, to link that to GPS data. And we also want to do uh, a Russian survey, and then we're doing some, some uh, studies on trend effects in perceived danger and uh, the role of emotions in decision making. Um, if you're interested in what we do, you can follow us on, we have a blog called thewhiteheatproject.com. Um, you can also find information on the Soan Avalanche um, site um, at MSU. And I just want to finish off by saying thank you for an awesome season. It's been a really great time being here at, um, in Bozeman. Um, I'm from Tromsø. We, back there, they had the shittiest season in uh, memory. No snow for a very long time. Now it's all facets, surface horror, and we got a huge snow event, so there are avalanches everywhere. I've been, I've been here. I've been here. All right, I think that's it.